Uh, it's summertime. It's summertime. Technically, it's not summertime until 10 days from now, but who cares about that? It's, schools are out. Yeah. <laughs> there it is, yeah. It's hot. Next week is going to be in the 90s. Hooray for that. Everyone loves really hot weather. <sighs> That's a joke. Anyway, but during the summer, we as a staff uh, like to think of more fun series to do with the church, something to go through that's not kind of your, your, normal, uh, your normal year's worth of, of sermons and stuff, and stuff. So we all got together, and we brainstormed, but we didn't brainstorm for very long because a book popped out uh, that my dad brought up, and we all loved it immediately. We grabbed it, and we are going to go with this book. So our series is called Infamous Scallywags of the Bible, which is based on a small group study book uh, called Notorious by Jeff Lucas. We'll be looking at and learning from the not-so-reputable characters of Scripture. So a little bit about me. Every time I preach, I like to give you something about myself, kind of some insight on me to see how I tick, that kind of stuff. Fun fact of Nate for this week is I love a good villain. I do. A good villain makes a story great. Now, don't get me wrong. It's not that I want them to win or that I'm rooting for him in, in any way. I love a villain to be bad so that the hero can rise up, defeat him, and, and you know, punch him in the face or something. I love that. I love that when the hero wins over a villain. Um, you, can, you can ask my wife when movies have their villains that don't really do much, or the movie tries to make them sympathetic, or at the end of the movie they're like, oh, they're not that bad. <clears throat> Disney, um, I, I don't like that. It annoys me to no end. I want my bad guys to be bad, and I want my heroes to be heroic, and I want them to, to flatten those villains. Some of the people we're going to learn about in this series are definitely villains, real-life villains from the Bible. And for the start of this series, our first scoundrel, spoilers, it's in your notes, Saul the Persecutor. Saul the Persecutor. Saul, later to be renamed Paul, was a devout Pharisee and an arch-villain of the gospel of Jesus. But he didn't remain that way, and we all know his conversion story pretty well, uh, I'm assuming. Uh, we actually just got done with the Galatians study, which Paul wrote, and if he was still an enemy of the gospel, I'm sure that would not have made it into scripture, but it did, so we know that he, his conversion was good. So today's passage, we are going to go be going to, through that story of Paul's conversion, but it's going to be straight from Paul's own mouth. So if you want to turn with me to Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 26. And I'll start reading from verse 1. Agrippa said to Paul, you are permitted to speak for yourself. Then Paul stretched out his hand and proceeded to make his defense. In regard to all the things of which I am accused by the Jews, I consider myself fortunate, King Agrippa, that I am about to make my defense before you today, especially because you are an expert in all customs and questions among the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. Okay, well, let's stop there for right now. So, Paul seems to be on trial here, right? That's what it seems like. So let's get some context before we continue on with Paul's story. What, what's going on in his life right now that he's setting his defense to this Agrippa guy? So in a nutshell, here's the, the backstory for it. And just as Paul had said, be patient with me, Agrippa, I'm going to say to you guys, be patient with me as we go through this context. So Paul is at a hearing not a trial, before King Herod of Agrippa and F King Herod Agrippa and Festus, the governor, uh, the Roman governor of that area. It all started when Paul went to Jerusalem and while worshiping in the temple was accused of desecrating it uh, for speaking about Jesus and for his mission to the Gentiles to speak the good news, good news to not Jews. And a riot against Paul was about to happen with the Jews when the Romans intervened, saving Paul and also protecting his rights as a Roman citizen. 
He is then moved to Caesarea because there was a plot that was planned against Paul by the Jews to kill him, and it was found out by the Romans, so they moved him to Caesarea, and he is then put into custody by Felix, the governor of that area at that time, until his sentence is declared. However, Felix puts that off for two years because he wants to keep the Jews happy. And a new governor takes his place during that two-year time, and his name is Festus, and that's the one we're going to be learning about today. Festus then hears Paul's story, and also wishing to please the Jews, asks if he could say, if Paul can go back to Jerusalem to have his trial there. And Paul says, uh, no, I'm going to appeal to Caesar now, because you're not taking care of this. So he appeals to Caesar, which Festus allows, because Paul is a Roman citizen, so he's allowed to do that. And a few days later, King Agrippa comes to visit Festus and wishes to hear Paul's case. And Festus agrees to this so that he can figure out some of the charges against Paul to put in the letter to Caesar for this charge. Okay, everybody got that? Everybody good? Good. If not, that's okay. That was a nutshell of chapters 21 through 25 of Acts. So if you didn't understand any of that, which I completely understand, uh, go ahead and read those four chapters. It's a long read, but it's good. So let's continue, let's, let's uh, go back to verse 2 and continue reading. In regard to all the things of which I am accused by the Jews, I consider myself fortunate, King Agrippa, that I am about to make my defense before you today, especially because you are an expert in all customs and questions among the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. So then, all the Jews know my manner of life from my youth up which from the beginning was spent among my own nation and at Jerusalem. Since they have known about me for a long time, if they are willing to testify that I lived as a Pharisee according to the strictest sect of my religion. And now I'm standing trial for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers, the promise to which our 12 tribes hope to attain. As they earnestly serve God night and day, and for this hope, O King, I am being accused by the Jews." Why is it considered incredible among you people if God, does, if God does raise the dead? So then, I thought to myself <clears throat> that I had to do many things hostile to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And this is just what I did in Jerusalem. Not only did I lock up many of the saints in prisons, having received authority from the chief priests, but also when they were being put to death, I cast my vote against them. And as I punished them often in all the synagogues, I tried to force them to blaspheme. And being furiously enraged at them, I kept pursuing them even to foreign cities. While so engaged, I was journeying to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining around me and those who were journeying with me. And when we had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew dialect, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to, it is hard for you to kick against the goats. And I said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and stand on your feet. For this purpose, I have appeared to you to appoint a to appoint you a minister and a witness, not only to the things which you have seen, but also to the things in which I will appear to you. Rescuing you from the Jews, pe the Jewish people, and the Gentiles to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light, and from the dominion of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sac sanctified by faith in me. So King Agrippa, I did not prove disobedient to the heavenly vision, but kept declaring both to those in Damascus first and also at Jerusalem and then throughout the region of Judea and even to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds appropriate to repentance. For this reason, some Jews seized me in the temple and tried to put me to death. So having obtained help from God, I stand to this day testifying both to small and great stating, stating nothing but what the prophets and Moses said was going to take place, that the Christ was to suffer, and that by reason of his resurrection from the dead, he would be the first to proclaim light both to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. Whew, that was a lot of reading. 
Thank you for being patient, just like I'm sure King Agrippa was. Okay, so Paul here, he has just given King Agrippa his testimony. His testimony, what he was like before he met Christ, what it was like when he did meet Christ, and then what he has been doing after he met Christ. So if you're looking for how do you form your own testimony, this is a great way to do it. Talk about what you were like before Christ, how you met Christ, and what you're like after Christ. Uh, I've heard a lot of testimonies, and many people like to focus on the before Christ, and then they say, oh, then I got saved, and we're done. The end. That's not a great thing. We did, what you did before Christ is dead. It's over with. What's important also is what you're doing with, uh, through Christ now. So I'm not telling you how to do it, but uh, that's how you should do it. So <laughs> Paul now opens up his case in verse, verses 1 and 3. He addresses King Agrippa directly, and he says, hey, it's fortunate that you're here, uh, to, that I'm telling you this story uh, to you, King Agrippa, because he is a fellow Jew. He knows the law. He knows the prophets. So all the things that regard Jesus in the law, King Agrippa probably would know about. So when he talks about Jesus and Jesus talking to him and all the things that Moses had talked about, King Agrippa, King Agrippa would be like, oh, yeah, I know that. Festus, a Roman Governor probably wouldn't know too much about that. Felix probably didn't know a lot about that. That's why I kept putting it off. He's like, ah, oh, whatever. So Paul opens his case. And then he explains his past. He lived as a Pharisee, the strictest sect of the Jewish religion. Now, it's funny. Uh, <clears throat> we hear the word Pharisee differently than the people back then probably heard the word Pharisee. We hear the word Pharisee and we're like, oh, Pharisee. They probably heard it like, oh, Pharisee, because it's different. Like, people back then respected the Pharisees. They were well-learned. They were very righteous. They knew the law. If you were a Pharisee, you were a higher class, educated, religious man. But we have, you know, 2020 uh, on our side, so we understand some of those things. But Paul lived as that. Paul was trained as a Pharisee. And he's telling Agrippa that, I know the law, I was once a Pharisee. And because of that zealousness that the Pharisees always had, he says he was hostile to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. He locked up the saints, he voted for their executions, he, for, he tried to force them to blaspheme against God, he would punish them in the synagogues, and he even pursued them from town to town. This man, Saul, is a villain. He's a villain of, to the Christians of that time. So much so that even when Paul is converted, he tried to come to the believers in Jerusalem, and this was their reaction. In Acts chapter 9, verse 26. When he, Paul, came to Jerusalem, he was trying to associate with the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was a disciple. And I got to tell you, I don't blame them at all. I don't blame them. If someone was taking all my friends, locking them in jail, voting for them to die, beating them in the synagogues, chasing them to, from towns, and he said, hey, guess what? I'm one of you now. I would be very skeptical. And that's the way it was until Barnabas had to vouch for him. But Saul's life was a mess. He was filled with hate, violence, obsession, self-righteousness, but all that changed when Jesus showed up. Paul is then, or Saul, is then converted and given a commission. Jesus stops him on the way to Damascus as he's trying to harass more Christians there. This is the story that we all know. He's on his way to Damascus. A blinding light blinds him and his, and his, friend, or the, his companions. And he hears someone say from the light, why are you persecuting me? And he says, oh, who are you, Lord? And he says, Jesus, I'm Jesus, the one you are persecuting. We all know that story, right? You've all heard that one? Good. But then in this chapter, when he's recounting his tale to King Agrippa, he says something else. He says, in verse 14, at the end, Jesus says to Paul, or Saul at the time, it is hard for you to kick against the goats. It seems like an odd thing to say. I am Jesus, and you're persecuting me. It's hard to kick against the goats. Okay, sure. A goad, if you don't know, I didn't know before this one, uh, is a tool used to control oxen. 
How many, how many knew that before tonight? Okay. All right. Hey, nice job, Tex. It's used to control oxen. So what is this go that Jesus is talking about for Saul? Well, a lot of biblical scholars think it, thinks it means this. Jesus has marked Saul as his own. The Holy Spirit has been working on him for a long time. And you kind of wonder, when would that have been happening? Well, many things plant seeds. Saul would have heard about Jesus' teachings and his miracles when they were happening. Jesus and Paul lived at the same time. They never met until the road to Damascus. But he would have heard about them. He would have heard about Jesus' teaching and the miracles. He would have seen the resolution of the Christians that he was persecuting. They would willingly go to trial or willingly go to uh, death for their beliefs in Jesus. So he would see that resolve. And specifically, he saw all of Stephen's murder. He was there. He saw Stephen's whole speech to the Jewish council, which is a great speech, by the way. You should read it. He probably saw the light that was coming from Stephen's face as he was being stoned, and he heard the words that Stephen uttered as he was dying. Forgive them, and I have seen, or I see Jesus at the right hand of God. So all these little things are probably the Holy Spirit poking at Saul. And Jesus chose him and was saying, it is hard for you to kick against the goads. It is hard for you to go against my will. So Jesus had a will for Saul. He chose him. And you know what? You're going to fight it as long as you can, but you won't succeed. You will not be able to go against my will. So this is when Jesus finally chooses him. And then Jesus gives him the commission. Be a witness to what you, what you have seen and what you will see. Open the eyes of both the Jewish people and the Gentiles. Move them from darkness to light. Move them from the realm of Satan to God. Basically, share Jesus with everybody. Share Jesus with everyone. And then Paul closes his little uh, speech to Agrippa with the outcome of his obedience. Paul was obedient to the vision of Jesus. And it was because of that obedience that the Jews seized him and tried to kill him. That's not much of a reward. That's why I chose the word outcome. Okay? Paul was obedient, and yet the Jews tried to kill him because of that. Now, we have fallen into the mindset, unfortunately, here in the Western American church that following Jesus doesn't cost us much. And right now it doesn't. We have been blessed to live in this country that there's not been very many violent acts towards those who speak the truth of the gospel. But Christ makes no promise that it will stay that way. No promise, no promise at all. In fact, the Bible promises the opposite. There may be earthly consequences for sharing Jesus pretty soon. In this country or when we go abroad, there may be consequences. Paul didn't have a problem with dying for Jesus. Do we have that same fortitude that he did is a question that we need to think about. Because we have it pretty easy here. So this is a huge change from Saul the persecutor to Paul the apostle. With his testimony, we can come to the theme of Paul's whole story, which is also the theme of the whole message. The theme is, with Christ, change is inevitable. With Christ, change is inevitable. Paul's story gives two truths that go along with this theme. The first one is, everyone can change. Everyone can change. When we look around us at people that we know or at old relationships we've had or relationships we have right now uh, with people, it is easy to see that people, they don't change really. People don't change. They stay the same. Oh, that guy has acted immature since he was 10 years old. That lady has always been a busybody. He will always and continue to be a mooch to you and your family. Those people over there, 
will only look out for themselves. And by human standards, yes, people don't really change. They stay the same. They stay in their rut. Their personalities do not change. But the difference is Christ isn't just human, is he? He's fully God, too. And the people who put their trust in Jesus, they're transformed. With divine help from the Holy Spirit, people can change. Paul is that perfect example of that. He moved from someone who was persecuting the church, jailed men and women for their faith, voted for their deaths, to someone who planted churches, to someone who himself was persecuted for his faith in Christ, and is now credited for writing one-third of the New Testament. Everyone and anyone can be saved. There are no lost causes. We all have people in our lives that we've kind of given up on sharing the gospel. We've kind of written them off. They'll never be saved. I might as well just give up. And uh, I'll think of a personal example. I used to work in a factory, and there was a guy named Jay whose sole mission was to debate me about the Bible, about my faith. And by debate, I mean argue. He liked to fight about it, and he really wanted me to stumble over my words, wanted me to rethink everything. And I would think, this guy is lost. He will never change his mind at all. But that was wrong thinking. That was wrong thinking. Christ can save Jay. Maybe he used some of my words as seeds to, save, to, to, to harvest salvation through, through that. Paul shows that those people can still be saved by Jesus. So that's anyone and everyone can change. Number two, Christ's followers should not stay the same. We should not stay the same. After we put our trust in Jesus, a process starts. Does anybody know what that process is called? Sanctification. Nice. Sanctification. The process of sanctification is becoming more and more like Christ with the help of the Holy Spirit. This is an inward change. So, uh, right now, in student ministry, we are learning about the book of Judges. And I don't know how many of you have read through the book of Judges, but every time a judge saves the people of Israel, and then that judge dies, the people of Israel would start to sin against the Lord again. And then God would send an army to destroy them, Then they would cry out saying, hey, save me, save us. And then God would send a rescuer, this judge. The judge would rule over them for a while. Then that judge would die. And then the people would go back to sinning. And after every single week, my students were like, why are they still doing that? Why are they still messing up like that? And I wanted a better answer for them than than to say uh, they're just dumb. That was not a good answer. So I I looked through some commentaries. Warren Wiersbe had the best uh, best way he described it was, The people of Israel at that time, they would only have an outward reformation. So when a judge would rule over them, they would change their actions to follow the rules of the man that was over them, but they never had an inward change. They never had an inward revival. They had an outside, outward reformation, but not an inward revival. So whenever that judge or that governing person would die off, the people did not have hearts for God, so they just went right back to the sinning the way they used to. And that's kind of like us. This is a, Sanctification is an inward change. We need to change on the inside so we are more like Christ so that in our outward actions reflect that. It's not the other way around. Our actions, we can do great things and still not have an inward change. Some of us might just be here right now. I'm at church. I'm doing a great thing. But our our hearts have not actually changed. So, let's say you have had that inward revival. But sometimes you feel like you're stagnant in your faith. You're not growing. You're not becoming more like Jesus. You're staying the same. Like we are not growing more like Christ. Why is that? Well, I have two possible deterrents here. One is, We have not moved on from our past deeds. We have not moved on from our past deeds. We hold on to what we have done in the past. We've sinned so greatly in the past. 
And we have this knowledge that we're forgiven. God has forgiven us. But we just can't get past it. And Paul kind of seems that way sometimes, too, if you read his letters. He's always, he calls himself the chief of all sinners, the least of the apostles, the lowest of the saints. He's always telling people about his past, how he persecuted Christians. And you might be thinking, but you don't know what I've done. I can't forgive myself. I actually, we, me and my wife have a, have a neighbor that ha- feels that way. Whenever, whenever a church or, or Christ is brought up to him, he says, I can't be forgiven. I've done too many terrible things. And he has this mindset that he can't be forgiven. And many of us kind of feel that way too. But if a perfect God can forgive us, what gives us the right to not forgive ourselves? God is perfect. We are not. He is forgiving us, but we can't let it go. Are our standards greater than his? They shouldn't be, because they're not. So I don't mean to say this to have us forget our past altogether. Paul didn't do that. But he would look to his past as a way of keeping himself humble. He would say those things, the chief of all sinners, the least of the apostles, the lowest of the saints, not to put himself down, but to keep himself humble. Because Paul did some great things. He planted a lot of churches. He saved a lot of people. He wrote a lot of a lot of letters and that we now use as scripture. So don't forget your past, but use it to keep yourselves humble and know that you are forgiven. Christ died for your sins. Whether it's one great one, many great ones, all these little ones, don't hold on to them. Your old self is dead. You have been reborn. So that's the first one. We have not moved on from our past deeds. The second one, Our habits do not reflect Christ. Habits kind of run our daily lives. And our daily lives run our whole entire life, if we think about it. When we wake up, it's usually set to have it. What time we eat, set. It's a habit. If we exercise, that's set to have it. When we go to work, when we watch TV, when we do all these things, usually they're habitual. They're on the same schedule. Habits choose for us how we live. And if we feel like we're staying the same in our Christian walk, we probably need to change or improve those habits, to be honest. Make it a habit every day to read your Bible. I'm sure Pastor Bob has said that a few times. Make it a habit to thank God for one of the blessings he has given you. Make it a habit to talk to someone about Jesus. If we want to be more like Christ, we need to change our habits, which change our daily lives. And our habits will turn into routine. And if we have Christ-honoring habits, that will change our life. Now, it won't be easy to begin with because they're not habits immediately. You have to make them a habit. You have to force yourself to read. You have to force yourself to pray. You have to force yourself to talk to someone about Jesus. You got to force it until it does become habit. Doing it once and saying, hey, there my habit started, that's not how So if we feel like we are not growing or we're not becoming like Jesus, we need to look at your habits and see if you need those to be changed. So let's take action. Let's close with this. Uh, I was really impressed, actually. Um, I've been talking with a lot of people in the congregation. uh, When Pastor Bob gives a challenge to everyone, uh, so many of you did it. Uh, So many of you did the challenges. So I'm going to jump on that bandwagon, and I'm going to give you more challenges uh, to do, uh, myself included. So number one, think about anyone you have labeled as a lost cause and pray for them. Think of anyone you have labeled as a lost cause and pray for them. Because there have been plenty of people in our lives that you're like, this person is not saved, and they will not listen to me. They're even hostile towards me. Pray for them. Because we know that not everyone is a lost cause. Saul was the biggest one until he wasn't. Okay? So, no one's a lost cause. Pray for someone that you know. Number two, if there is a past sin that you are holding on to, know that you are forgiven. Know that you're forgiven and let it go. To be honest, it'll be hard. It'll be hard to let those things go. It'll be hard to forgive yourself, especially if you've caused hurt to other people. But know that God has already forgiven you. That sin is behind you. That sin is dead with your old self. 
You are forgiven. Don't forget that. And number three, add three Christ-centered habits into your daily routine. Now, I don't know what that is. Some of you might already have some of those habits, but add three more. Because we are never going to be as good as Christ is. Even though we're moving towards him, we're never going to get there. So add as many as you can. Add three. Think of three for this week and do them every single day. Whether it's praying outside of meals, actually reading your Bible, or talking to someone about, about Christ, or, or just being more thankful. It could be anything. But make it Christ-centered. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for Saul and his story and the, the, the lessons we can take from that, that no one is a lost cause and anyone can be saved. Lord, Saul was a, was a great sinner, and I say that as a sinner myself. But you still found him. Jesus found him, and he was saved, and he did mighty works for you. So Lord, help that to be an encouragement to us that whether we're holding on to sin or we're holding on to what we used to do, none of that matters. You can still save anyone, and you can still use anyone. So, Lord, we thank you for this story. And be with us this week as we try to form those habits that are more honoring to Christ, that are more reflective of Christ, so that people can see that we are becoming more like Christ. And it's in his name that I pray. Amen.